In a, in a previous life, I was a university professor and I worked in uh, petrology, Jewish chemistry, study of water deposits. But then I made an excellent career move. I retired. And now I'm involved with this small company, which is called Cispro, which does the totally th things totally different. We use passive seismic methods to uh, study ore deposits and more recently, tailings facilities. Now, now I've been following the talks, many of the talks in the last uh, days, excellent talks, stimulating. And because of this, I changed slightly my talk. I was particularly struck by bursting the bubble, which I found very interesting, but also rather depressing because we learned from the four panelists who came from different uh, areas unconnected with mining, what they thought about mining and the opinions were pretty negative, moderately to distinctly negative. And I asked myself, well, what is this? Why, why do they have such a negative opinion of mining? Where do they get the information? Do they get it from, they probably don't read the technical papers, dinner party conversations perhaps, but more likely it comes from the media, you know, the mainstream media, the social networks and so on. And this led me to think, no, we don't have a journalist. I asked Sarah, is there a journalist? And we don't really have one in the um, conference. We have Ian Stewart, who's a television person, a television personality. And he gave an excellent talk, um, when was it, Monday, I think. Anyway, he talked about dialogue and co-creation, the need to, um, to, to uh, tailor our communication to interested groups. And this is fair enough, but this is not talking to the journalists, the media. And I think this is important because if you followed um, BBC or France, French television or New York Times or The Guardian or whatever, the coverage of mining is largely negative, largely negative for perfectly understandable reasons. You know, a train that arrives on time is not used. The Lachine mine, which operated very reasonably for, for a decade, and now the site is well remediated. That's not news. Rio Tinto blowing up the Aboriginal caves, the mine disasters, that's news, and that's what's reported. And the studies have shown that if you ask people what they remember in the last uh, month from news reports, they tend to remember the negative aspects, not the positive aspects. This is what we have to face. This is reasonable. It's important because another thing, aspect that was stressed by many speakers, the very reasonable idea that local communities should have a more say, perhaps a veto on where mines are sited. And where do they get their information? It will also come from the, from the media of different types. Now, we're not going to change this. We're not going to change how the media does their reporting. But I think we can expect or at least hope that the reporting is accurate and um, for this reason and I think this is not always the case so this is the main um, topic of my talk tailing stems how they fail and how they should be monitored so here on the right you see this remarkable terrifying image of Brumadinho mine collapse releasing this flood of tailings into the downstream area. Now there's some 3,500 tailing stamps operating per year and about each year on average one to three of them fail, causing many deaths, causing an ex uh, immense damage. And as in, in the global industry standard made one point that the current monitoring techniques are, in, and are inadequate. This is all very true and this is what I'll talk about later. But right for now, I'm going to talk about how these, um, these events are reported. So here we see, this is again Brumadinho and this flood of tailings, which caused immense damage, destruction and so on. But in the reports, here's one from the United Nations Human Rights Agency said that new evidence showed that the collapse released many million tons of waste, which was contained toxic heavy metals and toxic chemicals. And I asked myself, well, do iron ore tailings contain toxic heavy metals? 
It's a, it's a controversial subject. The representatives, representatives of Valley, which is the company, insisted that the mine is composed of sand and iron oxide and so on, is not toxic. But this is disputed by environmental groups who says that the opposite. And there's a paper published um, in Nature Scientific Reports that the tailings are composed of fine particles in the water containing a list of elements, iron, aluminium, and so on, which is, makes perfect sense, but zinc, copper, lead, and cadmium. And does it make sense this high contents of cadmium in tailings? So I had a look, what's the composition of tailing of cadmium in tailings? There's not much data, but here's one tailings as it happens from Ethiopia, but the cadmium content is negligible. So I had another look at this paper and what we see is this statement, levels of cadmium and oop, levels of cadmium and so on are much higher. So this is their study. They analyzed water and particulate matter upstream from the dam, just below the dam at very distances from the dam. And in this diagram on the right, there's distance as the concentration Upstream from the dam, there are various concentrations of metals. Immediately below the concentrations of many metals, iron and so on, are higher. And then it goes down to lower levels farther from the dam. But look at cadmium, a cadmium, which is really a nasty toxic metal. The concentrations just below the dam are high, but they're also high above the dam, which is surprising. Now, here's another study it was done by also Nature Scientific Reports. This is about the uh, Samarco tailings dam uh, failure also in Brazil. And they found dissolved metals here and the enrichment factors in the sediments included iron, but also arsenic and mercury. And the result of this study is that the adverse effects come not only from the dam failure, but also from artisanal mining for iron and gold. So what this is telling us is that most probably the baseline studies were not done correctly. The other effects, the other inputs into the river system of metals was not properly taken into account. So I'm not going to belabor this too much. I'm simply going to say the toxicity of tailings, at least from the major dams that recently failed, Samarco, Mount Poly, uh, Brumadinho, and Cadia, there, the tailings were probably, were, the tailings, anything that got into the environment were not toxic. But nonetheless, we know that these failures caused immense damage to the downstream environment, to communities, to the reputation of the mining industry. And the risk of failings must be reduced. So, how can this be done? So, here's Cadia. This is the dam that failed, it released tailings but not into the environment, just into the next tailings dam. Nothing got outside of here. What's interesting here is the study that was done here in this technical report, the study was, which was done about the causes of the failure. And what we see, what was concluded is that there's a low density layer in part of the dam, weak material which failed under load. Here's another article from science, which talks about the Mount Poly, Poly disaster, where part of the dam was, was constructed on a weak patch of clay in the foundations. The exploratory boreholes were not adequate to see this and you know, other aspects here. And they also identified four factors which can contribute to uh, the failures of tailing dams. One is liquefaction which occurs when water seeps into the dam to reach a level at which the whole, the material becomes fluid and, and, uh, and collapses. And this is one of the contrib contributing factors to the Brumadinho disaster. Then there are two other factors which are related to construction of the dam. And the filing, final one is shaking due to earthquakes. Now, our company, CISPROBE, together with EIT Raw Materials and Iramet, which is a French uh, mining company, are looking into how we can monitor tailing dams using this technique, ambient seismic monitoring. 
we have one project which will start soon in a mine from Iremet, of Iremet, New Caledonia, the nickel mines, where tailings as such are not produced, but they can produce these uh, piles of waste rock, which have to be monitored. They have to be monitored as the, as the, the pile builds up and as more material is deposited on older material. Now, what we there use there is that we deploy a series of seismometers like this. These are autonomous seismometers, which have powered by, pol by solar panels, which can operate for weeks, months, as long as we like. We use what's called passive seismic, which means we don't need explosions or vibrosized trucks as an active source. Instead, we can use whatever sets the earth vibrating, ocean, war ocean waves, trains, mine machinery, and so on. And the idea here is to monitor deformation in the, in the uh, waste rock piles. But what I want to talk about now is an, another system which I think is far more exciting. The idea that we can use optical fibers, optical fibers as sensors, sensors to different types of signals. Now, this is a collaboration between CISPROBE in France, between with Silixa, which is a UK company that specializes in optical fiber technologies, Hydra Research, which is a Swedish company with a large experience in dam monitoring. Now, the idea here is we use these fibers, which are commonly deployed in, my, in dams to monitor various changes of conditions within the, man, in, within the dam. They're commonly deployed to measure temperature, to measure strain and so on. And yeah, we'll just go on. So these are the three techniques that can be used. Our idea is to use optical fibers as a sensor for, to obtain three types of information. Temperature, which can monitor seepage of water into the dam, which can cause eventually liquefaction, but weakness in the dam. We use DSS, which monitors strain deformation within the dam. And we use the seismic techniques, acoustic monitoring, which can produce 3D images of the structure of the dam and of the underlying foundations. So here's some data, subsurface imaging, using the same cables as monitor strain and seepage and temperature and deformation. But here we have some um, seismic data. This is an experimental dam, which is constructed specifically to test the three systems. What we see on the right here is a scale of velocity. Blue is low velocity, red is high velocity. And there are areas here which we imaged using the technique which show areas of potential weakness. And here's another type of image from another dam of the foundations beneath the dam. And again, here the green is low velocity, the red is high velocity. There's an area of low velocity which probably, suggests, probably indicates a zone of weakness in the foundations beneath the dam. So this is the idea. For a dam like this, using the different techniques temperature, strain, seismic monitoring, we can look for liquefaction. We can look at aspects of the designs which are questionable. We can look for deformation in an upstream type of tailing dam. And we can also monitor earthquakes. We can monitor the effects of an earthquake, the influence that an earthquake might have on a dam following a local earthquake. So that's it. Thanks very much, Sarah. And I welcome any questions. Brilliant. Thank you very, very much, Nick. So ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for the fantastic Nick Art. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Nick. That's fantastic. Um, now, Nick, there are a couple of questions that have been coming in, which is great. Um, um, the question from John Clark, and he actually posed this to John Thompson earlier, but I, I asked him if it, we could re-ask it to yourself, Nick, because um, he says, do you think geotechnics have veered away from Earl Cole's theory for safe mining or safe tailing dams in the 60s when he championed the center line and downstream method as safer structures using coarse tailings, unlike the upstream method? Is this the basic problem and is it not being recognized? Um, they even Cole Krippenberger say on their internet site upstream only for arid and dry climates. Do you have any comments to that? Well, yeah, you know, I, fo I followed Laurie Raymeyer's talk you know, early in the, and, and I think he made this, expressed this very well. He said that, you know, the upstream dams are 
very clearly unsuitable in many places. They're unsuitable in areas with high rainfall. They're unsuitable in areas where there's, where there's seismic hazard. But he also made the point, he made the point, which is certainly uh, made by people in, well, Australians particularly, they say that if in arid conditions, upstream designs are perfectly adequate and there's no reason to ban them. Now, I guess I, you know, I, I, that sounds reasonable to me, but maybe John, you have a, have a comment as well since the question was addressed as well. Yeah, so, so please do feel free to um, engage in dialogue with the, with the, uh, the questioner, John Clark. But yes, um, Professor Thompson, sir, do you have a comment? <laughs> I, I don't respond well to that title, but anyway, uh, <laughs> um, I, I just want to re-emphasize what the point I made in my talk, which is th these are important technical discussions around them, how to construct the safest dams in, the, in a particular environment. And, and next points are correct and so on. In certain environments, upstream are technically correct. But it's not just about a dam. It's about to do, to do with the design of the mine, the amount of tailings you're going to produce, the life of mine. One of the major problems is mines is they're designed for a certain period of time and they vastly exceed that amount of time. And therefore the dam goes through long periods of construction and addition and addition and addition. And so whatever the original design is vastly exceeded by the, in, in the, during the life of mine. And that's, that's a system failure. That's not necessarily the technology of the original dam design failure. And so we have to take a much bigger view of, of tailings in the context of mining and in the context of people and people who are at risk, i.e. the communities, not just view it as a technical question, is upstream dams good or bad? Because it's not that, that is not the right question to be addressing, in my view. <laughs> Thank you for that, John. Thank you. And I think that looking at that broader context is so important. Um, certainly one of the, the last mines that I had the pleasure of actually standing inside it, um, they were really worried because they were running, the, the life of their tailing stand was rapidly running out. Um, and actually they then just re-looked at their process flow and they were like, hang on a second, we're chucking all kinds of things into our tailings dam that doesn't need to go in there. We can just send it around our processing loop once more. And suddenly the lifespan of their tailings dam just grew rapidly and actually almost saved the operation. So I think you're totally right, John, this, this interconnected thinking in terms of looking at the mine in the broader context is so, so important. And perhaps comes back, um, Nick, to another question um, for you. Um, which is around that of, of um, people often often ask me anyway about the risks associated with tailing stamps and what are those controls or those critical controls. And one of the problems with, with tailing stamps is that you can have all these fantastic monitoring activities and you've showcased three of them within your talk, which is brilliant. But the problem with that is that you can do as much monitoring as you like, unless you do something with that data, you're not controlling anything because the control is actually using that information, making a decision and acting on it. I don't know if you'd have any comments to that. The danger being that you could just think that you've got something under control because you're collecting lots of data rather than then acting on what that data is telling you. Well, you know, I guess I'm gonna talk a little bit, boast a little bit about our techniques because I think you know, they do provide some answers. The real, you know, the real difference, well, there are two major differences between current monitoring techniques, which use basically point measurements, pisometers and whatever, water levels and so on, compared with the, um, the, the optical fibers, which provide a continuous measure of what's happening across across the dam, within the dam, for, we can monitor the whole structure, particularly using the seismic methods because the seismic methods produce a, an X-ray image of the entire dam. The other thing is it's continuous, it's real-time monitoring. So we can get a signal from the sensors in real time. We can see immediately if anything is happening. We can see if there's deformation in the interior of the dam, not at the surface which you know, the, the most many techniques monitor only what's happening on the surface. We can see what's happening in the interior of the dam in real time, and we can send an alert to the mine operators saying there's something happening right now. Go and look, and look at it and see what's, what's the problem. So this is, this is, our, uh, this is our, our suggestion of how the whole situation can be improved. 
<laughs> Fantastic. Thanks, Nick. Um, one final cracking question that has just come in from Amanda. And she says, I was under the impression that the new global tailing standard on sorry, the new global standard on tailing stamps was very good. Are you saying that it is insufficient? Not at all. The, you know, the global standard says that methods for monitoring dams must be improved. It, more completely, they say design, operation, and monitoring of tailing stam must be must be improved. And I agree entirely with that. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you very much, Nick. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for the fantastic Nick Art. Thank you very much. Great. <laughs>